Good afternoon. Perhaps I say good evening. I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. I'm a Jefferson scholar, philosopher, historian. I want to talk to you today about Thomas Jefferson and the Reverend Hugh Blair. The title is Blair on Rhetoric and Bell Letters. Now, fineness of speech and writing, rhetoric and bell letters, were important parts, important arts in Jefferson's day because in part speeches and literature were frequent topics of critical discussion in polite society. We can hardly mingle in polite society without bearing some share in such discussions, writes Reverend Hugh Blair, the years, uh, his years are 1718, 1800, in his popular lectures on rhetoric and bell letters. Taste through sound criticism is one of the most improving employments of the understanding, he adds, to apply the principles of good sense to composition and discourse, to examine what is beautiful and why it is so, to employ ourselves in distinguishing accurately between the specious and the solid, between affected and natural ornament, must certainly improve us not a little in the most valuable part of all philosophy, the philosophy of human nature. We learn self-understanding and improve morally through study of the imagination. He Blair's lectures on rhetoric and bell letters published relatively late in his life, 1783, Recall he died in 1800, it would become Jefferson's go-to book on rhetoric. So we can assume that Jefferson's views on rhetoric were very similar to Blair's. On February 20, 1784, Jefferson writes to his friend James Madison, I shall take care to get Blair's lectures for you as soon as, uh, as published. Jefferson's statement is in reply to a request from Madison uh, a little bit earlier for a copy of the book, which Jefferson would thereafter highly recommend to others for rhetoric. Now, Jefferson, I think, was certainly on tenter hooks while waiting for the book, as he was familiar with the Scotsman from two other works that earned Blair celebrity. In his recommended list of books for a young gentleman's library to Robert Skipwith, letter in 1771, Jefferson lists Blair's A Critical Dissipation on the Poems of Ossian, written in 1763. Recommendation of that book comes as no surprise given Jefferson's especial fondness for the epics of Ossian, presumably gathered by James McPherson, who scholars today recognize was the true author of the poems. Blair um, directly addresses claims that the poems were crafted by McPherson and not by the old poet Ossian. Samuel Johnson was the loudest proponent of McPherson's fraud, and Blair defends the authorship of Ossian. There's no evidence that Jefferson ever questioned the authority of Ossian. Now, from 1777 to 1801, Blair also published five volumes in his, sermon, in his sermons titled uh, Sermons. On July 7, 1782, Jefferson writes in his memorandum book, paid on subscribing to Blair's Sermons 25. Though he was anti-sectarian when it came to religion, Jefferson that is, true religion was a matter between a man and his God, Jefferson also found moral inspiration in sermons, and it was the custom of his day that inspiring sermons of the most eloquent sermonizers be published for public consumption. Jefferson would sometimes recommend collections of sermons from sermonizers under morality, under the morality in this, uh, this catalog of books, for morality motivating reading. Though he was noted to be poor at delivering a sermon, Blair's style was cordial and his sermons were intelligent and logically written, and he was considered the most popular sermonizer in Scotland. Jefferson certainly also found uh, attractive Blair's anti-Calvinism as well as Blair's focus on virtue, not religious revelation. Now Blair preached trust in the goodness of God, in industry, in stoic resignation, and in disdain of indolency. As an illustration of Blair's easy manner of composition, there is his commentary on second book Peter 310 in his sermon on the dissolution of the world. The verse reads, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works 
that are therein shall be burned up. Now this is Blair's commentary on the passage. And I, I offer here a lengthy quote to give readers a, 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 a nice sample of the elegance of composition uh, and clarity of style and defense of elegance of composition. Okay. Blair writes, the dissolution of the material system is an article of our faith, often alluded to in the Old Testament, clearly predicted in the New. It is an article of faith so far from being incredible that many appearances in nature lead to the belief of it. We see all terrestrial substances changing in form. Nothing that consists of matter is formed for perpetual duration. Everything around us is impaired and consumed by time, waxes old by degrees and tends to decay. There is reason, therefore, to believe that a structure so complex as the world must be liable to the same law and shall at some period undergo the same fate. Through many changes, the earth has already passed, many shocks it has received and still is often receiving. A great portion of what is now dry land appears from various tokens to have been once covered with water. Continents bear the marks of having been violently rent and torn asunder from one another. New islands have risen from the bottom of the ocean, thrown up by the force of sub subterraneous fire. Formidable earthquakes have in diverse quarters shaken the globe and at this hour terrify with their alarms many parts of it. Burning mountains have for their alarms uh, excuse me, burning mountains have for ages been discharging torrents of flame and from time to time renew their explosions in various regions. All these circumstances show that in the bowels of the earth the instruments of its dissolution are formed. To our view, who behold only its structure, it may appear firm and unshaken while its destruction is preparing in secret. The ground on which we tread is undermined, combustible materials are stored, and train. the train is laid when the mind is to spring, none of us can proceed. Okay, Blair's commentary aims to reconcile revelation with reason. In the, the verse in Peter, from which I quoted, is not incredible, and once we go beyond the surface appearance of things, it even seems inevitable. What is true of the parts is true of the whole, because the natural laws that govern the parts also govern the law, the whole, as Blair thinks. The globe itself has given over the centuries abundancy of evidence of combustion. The earth is drying, decaying over time, like all living bodies dry, decay over time. Blair betrays a scholar's grasp of natural history, and he puts that expressively into his sermon. Jefferson could only have found Blair glory. Now, lectures on rhetoric and bell letters was perhaps Blair's most significant work. It was a collection of 47 lectures given while he's professor at the University of Edinburgh. Though it is a collection of at lectures, the book is, is no grab bag. It's remarkably structured. Each lecture follows another in a logical manner and marks him as the most significant early theorist on oratory and bell letters. The significance of the book is its comprehensiveness, structural integrity, and its scope. First, Blair draws from the early history of oratory, Demosthenes, Cicero, Quintilian, as well as from contemporaries such as Edmund Burke, Joseph Addison, and Lord Kames. Next, the 47 lectures are neatly and soundly structured in the manner of composition elegant yet plain is illustrative of points enumerated throughout the work. Last Blair focuses not merely on fineness of speaking, but also fineness of writing. That is, not just oratory, but also on bell letters. And he does so through examination not only of celebrated orations, but also of history and poetry. Bell Letters and Criticism, says Blair, consider man as naturally endowed with taste and imagination to embellish his mind and to supply him with rational and useful entertainment. He continues, 
All that relates to beauty, harmony, grandeur, and elegance, all that can soothe the mind, gratify the fancy, and move the affections, belongs to their province. Moreover, those arts bring to light various springs of action, which without their aid might have passed unobserved, and which through a, uh, though a delicate nature, frequently exert a powerful influence on several departments of human life. Yet, as they also offer repose to a mind strained by excessive activity, he writes, they strew flowers in the path of science while they keep the mind bent in some degrees and active. They relieve it at the same time from the more toilsome labor to which it must submit in the acquisition of necessary erudition or the investigation of abstract truth. Now, Fineness of speech and writing, says Blair, is thought by many to be a sham art. I quote, when the arts of speech and writing are mentioned, a sort of art is immediately thought of that is ostentatious and deceitful. The minute and trifling study of words alone, the pomp of expression, the studied fallacies of rhetoric, ornament substituted in the room of use. But Blair admits that rhetoric and bell letters have been often misused to the corruption rather than the improvement of good taste and true eloquence, but that has been noted since the time of Plato. But Blair continues with his modus operandi. I quote again, It is equally possible to apply the principles of reason and good sense to this art as to any other that is cultivated among men. If the following lectures have any merit, it will consist in an endeavor to substitute the application of these principles in the place of artificial and scholastic rhetoric. In an endeavor to explode false ornament, to direct attention more towards substance than show, to recommend good taste as the foundation of all good composition, and simplicity as essential to all true ornaments. Now, in keeping with Thomas Jefferson's own sentiment in his recommended course of study for a lawyer, one must aspire to excellence in speaking and writing for Blair uh, must have large acquaintance with the other fine arts, even the sciences. He writes, the orator ought to be an accomplished scholar and conversant in every part of learning. Now there can be no art, rich or splendid in expression, but empty of thought. Grace cannot compensate for want of matter. Thus beauty of expression without meaning is gibberish. Now, the aims of fineness in speaking and writing are perspicuity, agreeableness, purity, grace, and strength. Yet conformance to rules of right speaking and writing is insufficient for right speaking and writing. There are also private application and study, as rules alone cannot aspire genius. They can uh, direct and assist it. Rules cannot remedy barrenness, but they may correct redundancy. Rules point out proper modes for imitation. Rules bring into view the beauty that ought to be examined and the imperfections that ought to be eschewed. Consequently, while rules might be insufficient for genius, they are sufficient for keeping an aspirant from being a fool. I quote him. What would not avail for the production of great excellencies may, not, uh, may at least serve to prevent the commission of considerable errors. Now, Blair lapses into an apology for the art of fine arts, criticism. A study of rhetoric in bell letters, criticism, uh, is allied with sound logic, he elaborates. The study of arranging and expressing our thoughts with propriety teaches us to think as well as to speak accurately. True criticism is a liberal and humane art. It is the offspring of good sense and refined taste it aims at acquiring a just discernment of the real merit of authors. It promotes a lively relish of their beauties while it preserves us from that blind and implicit veneration which would confound their beauties and faults in our esteem. It teaches us, in a word, to admire and to blame with judgment and not to follow the crowd blindly. Now, outside of rejuvenating of the rejuvenative effects of cultivation of the fine arts, one of the strongest arguments in their favor is that they are diversion from the vices to which many are enticements. He writes, He is so happy as to have acquired a relish for these, has always at hand an innocent and irreproachable amusement for his leisure hours, 
to save him from the danger of many a pernicious passion. He is not in hazard of being burdened to himself. He is not obliged to fly to low company or to court the riot of loose pleasures in order to cure the tediousness of existence. Thus, Allah, Lord, came the pleasures of taste uh, taste have been placed by providence in a middle state between the pleasures of sense and those of pure intellect. Uh, we were not designed to grovel away amongst objects so low as the former, nor are we capable of dwelling constantly in so high a region as the latter. The pleasures of taste refresh the mind after the toils of the intellect and the labors of abstract study, and they gradually rise above it, uh, raise it above the enjoyments of virtue. A person introduced to the pleasures of taste, the power of receiving the pleasure from the beauties of nature and art, transitions readily to virtue. To be entirely devoid of relish for eloquence, poetry, or any of the fine arts is justly construed to be an unpromising symptom of youth and release suspicions of their being prone to low gratification or destined to drudge in the more vulgar and illiberal pursuits of life. Taste exercises tenderness and humaneness and weakens the grip of the barbaric and violent emotions. The elevated sentiments and high examples which poetry, eloquence, and history are often bringing under our view naturally tend to nourish in our minds public spirit, the love of glory, contempt of external fortune, and the admiration for what is truly illustrious and great. The sentiment is again consistent with Cain's on the benefits of cultivation of the fine arts. Now the characters of taste are two, delicacy and correctness. Delicacy concerns the perfection of that, naturally, of that natural sensibility on which taste is found. Correctness concerns the improvement of taste through understanding. I quote, the power of delicacy is chiefly seen in discerning the true merit of work, the power of correctness in rejecting false pretensions to merit. And while delicacy leans toward feeling, correctness leans toward reason. Finally, Blair, certainly following Aristotle's notion of dynamis in energia, potentiality and actuality, proffers a distinction between taste and genius. Taste consists in the power of judging, genius in the power of executing. And so genius is a higher power of mind than taste, for genius is in some sense the actualization of taste. Um, I add, I end by noting that, as I said before, this was Jefferson's go-to book on uh, rhetoric in Bell Letters. Uh, Blair himself was an eloquent writer. Jefferson, too, as all of us know, was an eloquent writer. And I think he took to heart the sermons of uh, Blair in terms of writing both with substance and with a certain amount of eloquence. I hope you enjoyed this lecture on one of the um, great influences on Jefferson's uh, writing style. And uh, if you did, please uh, give me a like and, uh, you know, uh, go to my uh, Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, bring him home to Monticello, and give that a like, too. Thank you very much, and enjoy this Fourth of July evening. Goodbye.